I've bought this amp of eBay a couple of years ago and I've been using it since pretty much every day. This is CA2000 and it's a Japanese model. North American and European models are named CA2010. There are a couple of differences besides stickers, plugs and voltage which are the obvious ones. Power consumption for Japanese model is 300 watts, for North American it's 450 and the rest of the world gets 900 watts. I also found the fourth model. Here it states the amp is 420 volts, but the power consumption is only 400 watts compared to 450 for the North American market. So I'm not sure what market is this model for. Japanese and North American models have got this courtesy AC outlet, but they are missing on the world model. She's got this voltage selector instead, which is kinda cool because you can use it anywhere in the world and don't need any step down transformer as I do. I've bought it from a Finnish bloke who was selling the end with the step down transformer, which was great because I didn't have to get one myself. The transformer's got the standard European plug, so I also needed an adapter for the UK socket. This thing, besides being an amplifier, is a piece of art. She came out in 1976, it was a time when Yamaha was still a company that cared for their products. It was Yamaha's iron product and I wonder if it can be considered iron even today. It came out a year after CA1000 Mark III, which was a bestseller in Japan as well as this newer CA2000 was. These two amps look almost identical, except for the tone control scripting. CA1000's got some nonsensical numbers, but CA2000's got actual dB increments. CA1000 Mark III was completely redesigned compared to her older sisters, outside and inside. CA2000 inherited the looks and most of the parts of Mark III. She gained 2 kilos, which is about 4.5 pounds, partly due to these two caps. 22,000 microfarads versus 18,000, larger heatsinks and power supply. CA2000 was a little bit more powerful. 120 watts versus 100 watts per channel to 8 ohms. I've noticed one interesting thing while taking off the wooden cover. Today's manufacturers brag about making everything by hand, which is kinda questionable every time they use this phrase. However, when you look inside this amp, it's very clear that every solder connection was made by hand and even inside the wooden cover are pencil markings left by someone who measured where these wooden blocks should be. She looks absolutely astonishing. Every part, every button, every knob is pretty much exquisite work. Not only she looks splendid, build quality is superb, every knob turns smoothly and every switch clicks like it's new. All that encased in a beautiful wooden chassis, which hasn't aged much after more than 40 years. Japanese i5 gear used to be top of the line, can you imagine today's electronics lasting more than 2 years? My particular piece is not perfect, she's got some dents and scratches, but I reckon she looks amazing after 40 years. This is just a power switch, nothing special there, except it feels really good just switching the bloody thing on and waiting for a relay to kick in. Headphones output is quite useless, who would use an amplifier with headphones. These view mirrors look gorgeous, and the amp itself looks so much better with them. The response is instantaneous during playback and they are very easy to read. View mirrors are usually useless except for being gorgeous, they become quite useful though when you press this button to rec out position. In this position, mirrors read output levels going through rec out terminals, which I'll show later why it's useful. This amp can work in class A or class B mode. If you want to make maximum out of her, or your retin is broken, just flip this switch, you'll get slightly better sound and also beautiful eating device, it's very good for winter evenings that is. Class A uses much more power and it can get quite hot, but you'll get lower distortion and clearer tone and quality in exchange. Can you actually hear the difference? I doubt most people can. You also lose a little bit of output power, you'll get 30 instead of 120 watts per channel, so we may need more efficient speakers than in class B. Sure, she can get quite hot, but I've never felt she's gonna overheat in class A. Unless you somehow block these vents. If I'd wanted to use class A all the time, I'd get some nice silent fan. Maybe it's a good idea even for a class B. But since class A puts a lot of stress on all the components, and the difference in quality is less than questionable, I've never used them myself. Subsonic and eye filter are in other words low pass and high pass filters which means it gets rid of very high or very low frequencies which can interfere in your listening experience. Subsonic filter cuts out frequencies below 15Hz, primarily to get rid of loudspeakers waffle rumble while playing vinyl records. 
It actually doesn't drop any frequency below 15 Hz, it only lowers the volume. It's pretty much useful only for full range speakers anyway, and you will need it during normal music listening. However, manual says it's safe to keep it on permanently, it shouldn't have any effect on sound quality, and from what I've tried, it really is safe. I filter, on the other hand, does the opposite, filters out frequencies higher than 10 kHz, and lowers the volume of these frequencies to get real vinyl cracking and popping noises. Everybody is familiar with tone control section. Bass controls bass, treble controls treble, and it works rather well. For bass control, you've got two turnover frequencies to choose from, 125Hz and 500Hz. For treble, it's 2.5kHz and 8kHz. Tone defeat is basically an off position, nothing else. Personally, I never use tone control, I fancy my music without any modifications. But I must admit, these controls are quite usable, it doesn't sound half bad. Audio muting switch does exactly what it says it does, it's muting audio. Either completely disconnecting all inputs from the main amplifier or lowering the volume by 20 dB. Disconnecting inputs is good for connecting new devices if you want to do it safely. Minus 20 dB is used when you drop in a tone arm onto a record or you want to operate other switches. Pre-out is certainly useful. I always use it when changing cables or connecting new devices without turning the entire amp off. However, minus 20 dB is kinda useless. I can't help myself. I simply love this volume knob with the balance control placed around it. It looks great and also works great. Well, for now. The knob turns amazingly smoothly. I know it's just a stupid volume knob, but I admire how it works after so many years. The craftsmanship is simply stunning. And this is how volume knobs look today. This is a very important switch for turntable users. For those using moving call cards, the obvious position is MC. Be careful though, if you use MC settings with MM cartridge, it will overload the amp and the distortion will be unbearable. For MM card, you should use one of these settings. 47 kilo ohms is the default, but you should play around with that and find out what's the best setting for your turntable. I set it to 100 for my turntable and it sounds much better. Rec out selector switch is quite interesting. If you don't want to record anything, just listen to music or whatever, turn the switch off, it will disconnect all output recording terminals. That's not the interesting part of course. What's interesting is that this selector can be used for recording something while listening to something else. For instance, to record from a tuner to a tape while listening to a different tape or a record. Well, it doesn't sound so special while listening to myself talking about it, but back in the day when this amplifier came out, it was a unique feature. On this is where you actually can use view meters. You can press this button and check recording levels while listening to something else. Input selector is pretty much self-explanatory. Turn the switch to the input position you want to listen to and that's it. She hasn't got too many inputs and outputs as some of amplifiers might have, but it's enough for me needs. A turntable, computer, tape deck or reel-to-reel -reel deck. She's got two for no ends, tuner, auxiliary, two tape ends or main in. Even though the amp's got two phono inputs, phono 2 can be used only with MM card and only with 47 kilo ohm impedance. Phono 1 input, on the other hand, can be used with either MM or MC card and you can choose between three impedance values for MM card. Auxiliary and tuner ends have the same specs, so it doesn't matter which one you use. I tried connecting my deck to both and it worked flawlessly. These terminals are for connecting a tape deck or a reel-to-reel -reel deck. Right next to them are terminals for tape recordings. If you want to use CA2000 solely as a preamp, you can do it by connecting power amp to these pre-out terminals. 2000's preamp is essentially Yamaha's C2, broken down and packed into this chassis. I wanted to test everything properly for this review, so I disconnected preamp with this coupler switch and connected my DAC directly to these main in terminals, which are basically power amp terminals. The coupler switch disconnects preamp from power amp section, so you can use different preamp or connect your audio source straight to the power amp section, which is mid deck in this case. Be careful while doing this though, the volume controls are not available anymore because they are part of the disconnected preamp. You need to control volume directly from your audio source, and if the audio source's volume is maxed out, you may easily overload and damage your loudspeakers, or even something else. Signal-to-noise ratio is rated a bit differently for each input. 
MC final stage is rated at 85 dB, while MM final stage is 96 dB. Auxiliary and tuner have exactly the same specs. They are rated at 100 dB, and lastly main in is rated at 118 dB. When I connected my DAC to main in terminals instead of auxiliary, I believe it sounded a little bit more detailed. But I may be mistaken, the difference was quite subtle really. I keep using auxiliary input, it's much more convenient. I'm pretty sure I don't need to explain what speaker terminals are and what they are for. The problem with MC is, I can't let you hear what I'm hearing. It will sound terrible through the mic and you wouldn't have any idea how she sounds anyway. But I can somehow describe my subjective experience with the amp. It's definitely one of the best sounding amps I've ever heard. It has lots of detail, the sound is absolutely clear and very pleasing. At least to my ears. If she's used for listening to music at home, her 120 watts is enough to drive pretty much any loudspeakers, and she drives them well. Class A is pretty much useless, I couldn't hear any difference. Maybe, maybe in very high frequencies I could hear a tiny bit of a difference in detail, but that doesn't justify the heat, the power consumption, and decreased life expectancy. I'd like to pit against some new amps like Hypex for instance, which has become kind of benchmark lately. I'm happy with this one for now, she works amazing and on top of that she looks gorgeous. Since Yamaha exhibited the Simplify on their website as some kind of milestone in their history, they must really take pride in this amp, and rightly so. She really is an outstanding piece of hardware and I simply can't find any reason to bash her. I'm not saying that she's the best amp in the world, but I love how she looks and more importantly how she sounds. I'd have to test all the amplifiers in the world to be able to declare that some amp is the best, but I can say for sure that this is one of the best I've ever listened to and getting one is nothing less than a delight. I just found out all my measuring equipment has somewhat failed me, so I'll make part 2 of this video in the future just with the measurements. On that's it for today, if you feel like it, leave a comment and see you next time.